Um, the slides have been put in order. So because of the ordering of the slides, uh, we will start the rating agency discussion with Bob Curter from Moody's, followed by Dave Hitchcock of Standard & Poor's, and then Q&A with everybody here. So Bob, please. So thank you, David, and uh, thank you all for uh, staying into this last panel. Um, I hope uh, and expect that some of you may have been hanging in to hear from David and I when the next rating action is going to take place and what it's going to be. I can assure you neither of us will tell you that, even if we knew we couldn't. Um, and by, this, by the way, we need some time to implement Joe Mysack's Stop That Now rating, so uh, run that by our credit policy folks. Um, I'm going to talk a little about our view of Puerto Rico. I, I think much of it reflects uh, some of the discussion we've already had today, a fairly robust discussion about the economy, its finances, uh, its debt profile, and um, uh, its management structure, which are the framework in which we look at um, uh, general obligation ratings and entities such as the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Um, the first slide here is a brief rating history. Um, it shows uh, from basically from 2010 to current uh, what our rating actions have been regarding Puerto Rico. Um, back in 2010, we had an A3 rating, had a negative outlook. In May of 11, we downgraded them. Um, uh, we put them on review for downgrade. Uh, in August 11, we downgraded them. Um, later in December, there was a double notch downgrade to BAA3 <coughs> negative. And then just um, uh, last month in December, we put them on review for possible uh, further downgrade. Um, <coughs> our rating rationale, uh, <coughs> excuse me, basically was that the government uh, has weakening liquidity, as we've all been talking about earlier, uh, increased reliance on external short-term debt, constrained market access, as we talked about in the last panel, and uncertain prospects for growth and a persistently sluggish economy. Um, the economy, of course, has been a, a major factor for the Commonwealth. They've been in recession for the past seven years, and while the U.S. economy has begun to turn around and, um, and show some growth, Puerto Rico really hasn't. In the past, we've observed that Puerto Rico's <coughs> excuse me, economy has tended to move um, in concert with the U.S. economy, although at a lower rate. Um, part of the reason we believe for the departure of uh, the direction of the Puerto Rico economy from the U.S. economy has to do with the expiration of Section 936 benefits and um, the weakening and departure of the very crucial pharmaceutical industry. Um, we would also note in our rating approach that these factors are exacerbating uh, the longstanding financial strain caused by the Commonwealth's high debt load and pension obligations, as we've been talking about earlier, um, and its chronic budget deficits. Um, while the island's economy is more narrow, uh, is more developed than most other Caribbean islands, uh, it's still very narrow. Um, it's hard, high reliance on government employment, which is about 29% of employment on the island. Uh, pharmaceutical industry, which is about 40%. Uh, of the economy is also um, a very critical industry, and as I said, one that has been contracting as the um, tax benefits of locating there have, uh, have been phased out. Um, and while tourism is an important, it, it's a surprisingly small component of um, Puerto Rico's economy, it has been doing well, but uh, uh, not only is it a small component, but those jobs clearly are um, lower paying than the pharmaceutical industry and uh, um, will be difficult for Puerto Rico to develop because they're, of course, in a very competitive part of the world for tourist dollars and aren't always uh, the first choice destination. Um, there are some green shoots that we note. Uh, the Commonwealth, I think, has been <coughs> working very hard to improve their economic development base. Um, they have made some progress. There are some new plant locations. There are some new industry activity, there are some new tourist developments, um, there are uh, clearly, you know, a government, 
program to try to attract these industries and try to develop them more, including um, under the flag uh, sectors. We spoke a lot about um, the federal government and whether or not they will intervene uh, to help Puerto Rico. Um, there are, of course, many direct and indirect ways in which the government can help Puerto Rico. Uh, one of them is these sort of under the flag uh, uh, designations, which simply means that the federal government directs defense contracting, whether it's producing uniforms or other activities to take place in Puerto Rico. And, um, and that, of course, can help their, um, their economy. And the federal government, of course, can do these things ne without necessarily having a budget for them or having uh, to seek congressional or other approvals. Still, the trends are negative. Uh, again, uh, not a lot of news here. The population has been declining. Um, we'd note that it's uh, down 3% since 2005. Uh, um, of course, uh, you know, declining population is a sign of the weak job market. Um, not clearly, not nearly as severe as we've seen in Detroit, which of course lost half its population over a 50-year period. Um, Puerto Rico's population decline is still slow, but nonetheless steady. And of course, um, it, it's a very, you know, unlike a lot of other parts of the world, it's very easy for educated people or people who have um, better job prospects to come to the U.S. They are, of course, uh, are U.S. citizens and um, no more difficult than hopping on a plane and going to Orlando or anywhere in the New York area or really anywhere in the U.S. And of course, we continue to see that happening as the job market remains very stagnant. Um, as I said earlier, we had seen historically that the Puerto Rican economy uh, tended to move in concert with the U.S. economy. Um, we've seen that departure now. Uh, the question is, you know, how long will that last? How much lift will they get from the improving U.S. economy? And how much further contraction we will see from the um, uh, contraction in the uh, pharmaceutical industry? Um, again, if we see any growth, any stability, our view is that it's likely to be quite modest. Um, and uh, again, I think supported by a very high level of transfer payments that come from the U.S. in the form of aid programs as well as um, uh, Puerto Rican natives who are returning funds back to their families uh, back on the island. Uh, their finances are still weak. Uh, we, uh, again, talked earlier about some of the extraordinary measures that the Commonwealth has been taking to try to control spending. Um, uh, structural imbalance has declined, but it's still significant. It's still about in uh, the current fiscal year that they're in about 8% of their adopted budget, about $820 million. Um, and their current budget is predicated on an underlying growth rate of about two-tenths of a percent, um, which would be an improvement over uh, where their economy has been performing to date. Um, you know, our view is that, uh, that those numbers may be a little on the optimistic side. And by the time we get to year end at June 30th, the Commonwealth, of course, has a July 1 to June 30th fiscal year. Um, you know, we are expecting that we may see some widening of this deficit uh, and some further weakening in the economy. Um, the budgetary gaps appear to be, you know, continue to be addressed uh, with deficit bonds. Um, Joe, maybe if he'd been reading our reports a little closer, would have noticed that we've commented on this pretty regularly. Uh, sorry, Joe. Just. Um, but you know, clearly the scoop and toss deficit financings, I have a little chart I'll show you later, which kind of makes it very clear what they've been doing. But clearly the ramp up in their, in their debt, almost all the COFINA debt that they've issued, which is quite sizable, has really been used to, to plug current operating budgets. And, um, uh, and they continue to do that in this year, doing scoop and toss, meaning you know, issuing bonds today to pay current debt service and backloading that debt service uh, further into their uh, debt schedules. Um, there's a, uh, almost a $600 million transaction that they're, um, uh, $600 million in debt service that they're planning to restructure even in the current year. Um, you know, all revenues are above uh, their expectations. They've, of course, enacted some major new uh, tax initiatives. Um, obviously, the revenues are up because the taxes were raised. Uh, but they're still very close to their own budget estimates, um, slightly ahead at this point. And again, I think as the 
next quarter and two quarters unfold, we'll have a better sense of how those taxes actually finally performed. Um, and of course, as the previous panel went into in a good deal of depth, all of the recent market volatility has significantly narrowed the Commonwealth's financial flexibility. Uh, they continue to be very narrow in terms of liquidity, although they've taken a number of actions to bolster their liquidity lately, including um, uh, bringing in deposits uh, from Commonwealth agencies um, to uh, back to GDB so that they can use those for borrowing, uh, for operations, and uh, some private placements that they have entered into with banks uh, to bolster their liquidity. And while that's good, and in our view, uh, their liquidity is ample, at least through the current fiscal year, um, all of the actions that they have taken to increase their liquidity you know, are through borrowed assets that they still owe, and we count that as part of their overall debt burden. So um, yes, they're increasing liquidity, but they're borrowing it. They still owe all that money back. Um, <laughs> Puerto Rico is very hard from a muni analyst perspective to get your arms around. It really doesn't look like anything else we have in the muni sector. Um, a, a chart like this shows uh, you know, just debt per capita uh, so we measure our U.S. states on a debt per capita, and we measure Puerto Rico, and you can see it's just off the charts. Um, we look at their uh, pension liabilities as a percent of revenue. Um, Natalie was talking about this earlier. And again, it's, it's really off the charts. Um, in our own rating committees, we tend to try to look at Puerto Rico in the context of other sovereigns, uh, other entities that have higher debt loads, um, at the lower rating levels. Of course, we're not comparing comparable rating levels here. Our average U.S. state level rating is uh, AA1, and of course, Puerto Rico right now is BAA3 on review for possible downgrade. Um, we did this little chart just to kind of help, I think, maybe explain what's happened in the last uh, seven years. Um, and, uh, you know, again, as how did Puerto Rico you know, managed through this downturn and how bad was it? Um, I, I hope uh, you can see, I'll try to read some of this to you if you can. Uh, just talking about population loss in the last six or seven years, you know, 3.8 million versus 3.7, dropping, but not, um, not Detroit-like. Uh, um, employment was a little over a million, it's now around 900,000, so there's, you know, a 10% drop in their employment base, manufacturing employment has dropped, um, from about 110,000 to 75,000, reflecting, I think, that core pharmaceutical sector, which is 40% of their employment base. Um, government employment has dropped too, so the Commonwealth has been making cuts, it has been downsizing this government that's very dependent on uh, public sector employment. Um, and its revenues have been flat. They have done a lot of spending reductions. They've been painful, uh, they've been difficult, uh, there's been public reaction to them, but um, you know they have been holding the line on spending. Um, nonetheless, the deficit is still substantial, uh, almost 20 percent. Um, and um, if you look at you know how they managed to get through this whole period and maintain spending in the face of this declining economy, just look at the tax-supported debt, uh, which has grown from about 32 billion, uh, in our calculation, to over 50 billion um, during this period. Um, their uh, GNP, you know, has risen, but somewhat modestly, and of course their ratio of debt to GDP, uh, GNP rather, uh, has grown pretty substantially, and, um, you know, is comparable with a lot of lower rated sovereigns. Um, their pension liability, of course, uh, is, is huge, as Natalie talked about earlier. You know, they've solved their uh, employee retirement system. Uh, on a cash-funded basis, not on an actuarial basis. Um, that's good news. Uh, their employer retirement system is a closed plan, so there's a finite life to it. It's been closed for a while. So there's kind of a 20-year period that they have to bridge. If they get through those 20 years, they can extinguish a lot of this liability. Um, but getting through the 20 years is going to be a challenge, and their solution entails raising employee contributions, but also substantial additional employer contributions, meaning the Commonwealth and its operating budget. And so those operating pressures 
um, are arising and likely to continue. Um, and lastly, you know, per capita income, again, if I put this on a chart relative to the states, you know, they're kind of off the charts on states with per capita income, you know, in the 33 to 40% range. Um, just to give you a little benchmark, uh, Arkansas and Mississippi, by comparison, are like 75% of the U.S. So uh, clearly, this is a much more third world kind of an economy. Um, nonetheless, there are a number of uh, credit positives that support this rating and our view of it uh, right now. Uh, obviously, the strong uh, links to the U.S., uh, the fact that they benefit from the U.S. regulatory and legal systems, it presents a degree of stability that you don't have with a lot of um, Latin American or other uh, European sovereigns. They have broad powers to raise revenue and control spending. Um, there's a constitutional first priority lien on revenues for the GO debt and other Commonwealth guaranteed debt, an important uh, protection. Um, they get a lot of uh, transfer payments, as we've talked about, Social Security, uh, nutrition assistance, veterans benefits, transportation aid, um, Medicaid, Medicare, and stimulus funds uh, in the ARA program uh, that was enacted back in 2007 and 8. Puerto Rico did extraordinarily well on a proportionate basis, much better than any other U.S. state, and, um, and that helped to provide some stability to their economy during the very difficult downturn. Of course, it didn't prevent the economy from weakening further. Um, Puerto Rico also benefits from being covered by FEMA laws, so unlike other Caribbean nations, you know, when disaster strikes, the federal government is there to pick up 90 or 100 percent of the disaster recovery expenses, and we know how important that can be for an island nation. Um, their residents, of course, don't pay U.S. income or gas taxes, but they get transportation aid. Um, and uh, the Commonwealth has, you know, taken some important actions to try to stabilize their finances during this downturn, and as we mentioned, in creating new revenues, uh, enacting pension reform, um, and improving the liquidity at GDB. Um, nonetheless, I think you know, it's important to take a closer look at the legal framework around Puerto Rico's debt. Um, their bond financings are governed by Puerto Rico law and the U.S. Constitution. Um, precedents exist for hearing contractual and constitutional disputes in federal courts, which is important. And um, Puerto Rico local court decisions can be appealed directly to the U.S. Supreme Court. The Puerto Rico Constitution does provide a first priority lien on available resources of the Treasury for the benefit of a GEO bondholder. Um, this provision uh, is commonly referred to as the clawback provision. Um, and um, the COFINA property ta sales tax bonds uh, you know, are available um, from the, uh, you know, are protected by opinions of the Secretary of Justice and Bond Council. We would note that this has not been tested in law. Um, the notion that the COFINA sales tax revenues are not subject to the clawback and are separate um, from the Constitutional Treasury of Puerto Rico. Um, we have rated these in accordance with the Justice, uh, the Secretary of Justice's opinions, but we know there is no legal precedent in that regard. Um, they do have the ability to amend the Puerto Rico Constitution by two-thirds vote, although that hasn't happened since 1970. Uh, the Contracts Clause, of course, applies. Um, Puerto Rico is prohibited from filing for bankruptcy, um, uh, and uh, municipalities are also prohibited from filing for Chapter 9. Um, nonetheless, uh, like any other sovereign, they have the ability to invoke police powers, and just because all these protections exist doesn't mean that they can't default um, the way Greece or uh, Argentina or other nations have. Uh, those nations also issue full faith and credit GO bonds, but you know when uh, they're unable to afford that debt and need to restructure, that's what they do. So just to wind up, um, what are we watching and what are we seeing? Um, obviously, we're looking in this review period at uh, private sector employment and other trends. Private sector job losses uh, in 2012 of 2 to 3% seem to be continuing <coughs> due to, as I said, declines in the pharmaceutical area and also continued population losses. Um, prospects for widening the structural gap 
uh, in greater need for structural finances is certainly uh, possible given you know, the new tax revenues that they've enacted and the continuing weakness in their economy. Uh, we do uh, have an expectation that that $820 million um, budgeted deficit will widen. Um, we're watching, of course, uh, GDP's liquidity, uh, and um, we've noted that narrow it is it, as it is, they have adopted a number of actions that are improving their liquidity, uh, of course, adding to their, um, their debt load on their balance sheet. Um, lastly, we're watching the pension liabilities and, of course, uh, the progress of um, these teacher reforms that have been enacted and, as we learned earlier, now stayed at least temporarily by the um, Puerto Rico courts. So with that, I will conclude and uh, turn it over to David, and we'll be glad to answer questions after that. <coughs> Can you hear me okay? I always have to adjust it up because I'm a bit taller. Um, <clears throat> we uh, downgraded um, our geo rating in uh, March uh, and also assigned a negative outlook uh, from a straight triple B at that time with a negative outlook. Uh, our outlook horizon is two years. Um, I know that the other guys have watch lists our credit watch is basically uh, confined to where there's a 90-day window of a specific event. So I should just say that because we have a negative outlook and not necessarily a watch doesn't necessarily mean at any given time within that two-year period we couldn't take a rating action. In fact, we took a rating action without going to watch uh, before when you had a triple B negative. So. Um, I just wanted to leave that because I've been getting some questions in the wake of the other guys' watches. Um, if we see a very specific uh, event, we could put something on watch, but if it's a long-term trend, like economic trends, and we have the information on hand, we'll just take the action. But if we see that there's something that we don't know, but we could know within the next 90 days, that would be our, within our criteria for a watch list or a credit watch. Um, so we affirmed the rating, uh, released a new rationale and an FAQ, because quite frankly my phone was ringing off the hook. Uh, the FAQ is in about the list of uh, frequency of the questions I was getting from hedge funds, some of which I see here in the room today. Um, and uh, we also uh, changed the rating outlook on the COFINA bonds, primarily for economic reasons, uh, in September. Uh, and that basically uh, reflects what we see as some secular, very long-term trends in the economy and some of the economic declines and the need for economic growth, uh, particularly in the out years. So I'm going to go over some of the key features. Uh, we use our state rating criteria to look at Puerto Rico, and uh, <coughs> if you Print out our state rating criteria, it's about 22 pages. It's got many tables, many metrics, and data points. Um, so I'm just going to hit the key points here and maybe talk a little bit about some of the current trends and uh, events and uh, where we might be going here. So the first key point, which all the panels up here have already talked about, is we have a long history of structural deficits, sometimes rather large. Um, I've been part of our Puerto Rico team for over a decade. Uh, and I remember, I was on it when they actually had uh, an operating surplus, uh, if you go back about 13 years. Uh, and then the first year when they had a deficit, they said it was temporary. Um, next year they said, well, the year after next, we'll close it. And then it became the year after next and the year after next uh, for over a decade. And there was a good reason at the time, it seemed, for saying that maybe there was an unexpected economic decline, uh, although maybe in hindsight not quite so unexpected. Uh, they've had an economic contraction every year since 2006 when some federal tax breaks 
uh, for manufacturers on the island exporting to the mainland expired. Uh, we don't believe that that's a coincidence. Um, and, and even in the one year when they had an uptick, it was a very small uptick. Uh, they've had some long-term uh, population loss trends. It's been about 4% over the last decade. Uh, and as Bob was looking at it over the last five years. Um, the Puerto Rico Planning Board recently released a long-term projection uh, projecting some uh, declines uh, <coughs> over a decade and eventually uh, projecting they'll get down to about 3.3 million from about 3.67 million now. Um, and part of that is the lack of economic opportunities. Young people are leaving the island to pursue uh, jobs in the mainland. Um, I know partly because my boss is one of them a long time ago, not recently, but uh, he was from Puerto Rico. And if you talk to him, he said there wasn't uh, opportunities for high paying jobs at that point. Um, and I'm not sure that that's really changing. Um, there has been recently, over the past few months, an uptick in the Government Development Bank Economic Activity Index, which looks at some key numbers and uh, is correlated with uh, changes in um, gross product. Uh, but over this period since 2006, we've seen periods of three months of an uptick, uh, which eventually went down. So what we really need to do is to look at some long-term trends. And year over year, uh, some of these trends in employment and so forth are going up. Employment's a tricky th thing because um, the, the biggest sector for employment is government. But if you actually look at the biggest sector for gross domestic product, it's manufacturing, which is only about 89% of employment. So uh, it doesn't necessarily correlate with um, economic activity, but uh, it's certainly a, a key point. And they've got high, last year they had earned 12, uh, they had about 15% unemployment. Um, and they have high debt and pension liabilities. Uh, I'd agree with Bob, it's sort of off the chart uh, compared to um, some uh, states. Uh, we're looking at um, uh, what we calculate in our calculation debt to uh, gross domestic product of about 38%. Uh, it's a lot worse as a percent of income. And uh, it's been growing. Uh, and, uh, you know, somewhat less than 50% growth since 2009 in particular. A lot of that's been driven by deficits um, and uh, the scoop and toss, um, which pushes maturities out. You have to refinance it again the next year or the year after. Um, and so this is our calculation. We actually have a calculation of net tax supported debt that seems a little bit different, but not too far off of uh, my other panelists here. Um, and uh, so um, we see uh, actually, uh, the, a lot of people throw around, um, but we, that numbers, that last number is off. It should be uh, actually about 38 billion. Uh, that's a typo. Um, but I see a lot of people tossing around in the papers, and uh, if you're publishing the slides, I'll give you a correction. Um, 70 billion, and when, uh, after the Barron's article, I saw a lot of articles with different estimates of total tax supported debt or tax or debt in Puerto Rico. And uh, there was different numbers, and somebody said 70 billion. I think people have fastened on to that as the highest number, and maybe there's a bit of an echo chamber um, repeating that. Uh, but we, we don't get uh, 70 billion. Um, if you add in non recourse debt, highway authority, other stuff, um, you, you start to add about another 25 billion um, to the 38 billion. But um, it's. Uh, I noticed Steve and the other guys, you didn't have 70 billion either, so I don't know if you want to comment later. Uh, but we have slight, but it's still high no matter how you look at it. And this is our calculation of some of the structural budget deficits. I should say that structural budget deficits is not the actual deficit. This is ongoing revenues to ongoing expenditures. So there's a lot of one-time uh, events. You have to close your budget eventually, even if it's by borrowing. <coughs> Um, but we're taking out borrowing. We're also taking out other one-time actions, uh, 
where they accelerate tax revenues from a future year into the um, current year. Uh, but you can see uh, since 2006, and, and we've been publishing updates to this every year, uh, Joe, um, so that uh, I don't think it's necessarily been hidden, uh, but we have had uh, some very significant uh, structural deficits for a long period of time. So that being said, and I, I didn't get into the pension uh, because some speakers before have talked about that. Uh, it's obviously a significant concern about uh, same magnitude as the debt, uh, many other things that we're looking at. But that being said, um, why is it still investment grade, which is probably the question I get most often. Um, although we do have triple B minus with a negative outlook, which would say if current trends continue over our outlook period, there could be a rating downgrade. Um, but first thing I'd say is that there are real adjustments being made in the budget. Uh, they are making efforts. Uh, it was not easy to do pension reform. Uh, the teachers reform did get delayed. Originally they were talking about doing it last summer uh, and then it got delayed, but they, they did it. Uh, we'll see if it actually holds up in court. Uh, but that was a very tough thing to do politically. Uh, the employees retirement system, which is larger, that was a tough thing to do. Uh, we still have concerns, as Natalie mentioned out, uh, as Natalie mentioned earlier, um, there you have to look at the quality of the assets. Maybe you could say that uh, the fix uh, could have some actuarial question marks to it. Uh, but basically, um, they have on a cash flow basis taken actions. Uh, they've added into the budget money to pay for the higher costs uh, as part of the fix for the fiscal 14 budget. Um, so they're actually uh, taking action and, uh, and working on it. They implemented tax increases. Uh, it wasn't necessarily on the populace. It, it is on corporations, but it's over a billion in new uh, corporate taxes. Um, it took a while to implement some of those tax increases, so we'll see a full year of collections which will uh, bump up some of those uh, taxes next year. Um, liquidity, uh, we don't believe is, in our opinion, an immediate concern. When I say immediate, I'm saying the next month, uh, <laughs> maybe the month after. Um, so I have to be careful how I phrase that. Um, but they still have to finance the 14 and 15 deficits. Now they can do that through loans through GDP. Uh, they are, uh, I don't know if you'd say blessed, but they do have the benefit of having a bank, only I think North Dakota has a state bank uh, where they can actually get loans, um, originally over a billion of liquidity. Um, it's not fund balance, it's liquidity that has to be paid back if they transfer money from agencies and perhaps even cities, uh, they can raise that a bit. But all it does is just buy them time. Uh, eventually, if you keep having deficits, uh, there comes to be a limit how much you can do that internally. Um, there's other swap risks. Uh, if there's a downgrade, and we've looked at that, we don't believe that there's enormous um, calls. We believe it could be covered by GDB. But I look at the other agencies and I wonder if some of those risks could be um, triggered and they're probably looking at me too. I don't know, um, we don't, we're not allowed to talk to each other. Um, but um, you know, there's some concerns there uh, in terms of market access. Um, they placed about a billion dollars, uh, well it was a billion dollars currently outstanding of cash flow notes and so the presumption would be we don't have the 15 budget yet, but they might have to place more cash flow notes next year. Um, and so that, would, that could be a potential concern. They have to renegotiate some liquidity agreements on the variable rate demand obligations. Um, I've seen some numbers floating around as to what sort of liquidity might actually have to be covered by GDB. It, it depends if you use the, uh, the bans for the highway authority, which is not necessarily general fund supported. Um, you can look at it different ways, but uh, in general, we believe that there is some ability by GDB in the short term to cover some of these near-term liquidity risks. 
But again, all it does is buy you time. So what they really need to do is to close their operating deficits. Other things that they've been taking, apart from the tax increases, is that they're uh, particularly making uh, the water authority uh, self-supporting. Uh, it was very politically difficult to put in some of the rate increases on the water and the electric. Um, and basically, that will help shore up the general fund indirectly. Um, we have a cash flow projection with actual cash flows. I know they post on their website, on the GDB website, revenues and expenditures. We have, unfortunately, on a confidential basis, uh, actual cash balances each month. And uh, they're running over the projections. We get a monthly update. They're running better than what they were at the start of the year. Um, you always have to be a little careful when you look at cash balances. We had a, I remember when I started out years ago at S&P, there was a um, managing director that said, be careful because uh, once he asked New York City, uh, you know, why their cash balances are running low, and uh, the official said, well, how high a cash balance do you want? I just won't pay people for however many weeks you want, and they'll have whatever cash balance you want. So uh, you have to be a little careful and look at the end of the year, but we don't believe that there's an immediate liquidity crisis, uh, but certainly concerns. Um, they do say that they want to lower the deficit next year. We're going to be looking very carefully at the budget that's introduced for next year and what's enacted as uh, part of our negative outlook. Um, very recent developments. Uh, you have to be careful when you submit the slides because I guess they can get outdated in a day or two. Um, but they, they did enact the pension, the teacher pension reform. We'll see what happens in the courts. Um, <coughs> The revenues and expenditures, it's always good when their revenues are higher and expenditures are lower. Uh, that has not been the case for most of the last decade. So I really think that that's uh, a little bit of an inflection point. If you, unfortunately, if they meet budget, uh, it's still in about an 8% deficit. Um, and I talked about the Government Development Bond Bank uh, Economic Activity Index. Um, <coughs> They, the transfers of Commonwealth deposits to GDB, again, I think that's just a short-term fix. They really have to fix some of the other problems. So uh, again, let's get to the questions I get asked the most. Um, what could lead to a downgrade? We've got a negative outlook. Um, well, if they have a deficit that's larger or uh, materially larger than 8%, uh, which is what they say they're going to have, that could be uh, one reason. Um, they don't make any progress in reducing the size of the deficit in 15 to relatively low levels or, or get, getting rid of it altogether. And they say, again, when they passed the 14 budget, they said the year after next we'll have structural balance, which is fiscal 2016. So they really need now, because they, they've run out of time, they really need to get structural balance by 2016. So if we feel that that's not achievable or not going to be achieved, uh, we could take action. Um, one reason that it might not be achievable is economic contraction. Uh, year over year, again, it's still continuing. We don't know if the, what's happened in the last couple of months will continue. Um, and then we have market access, which is a very tricky thing to define. Um, and again, it's somewhat dependent on what maybe other people do. When I look at market access, I'm particularly looking at the Cofino lien. Um, and so uh, why there might be problems um, with the GO, if they can still access the market through Cofina and finance their deficit in 14 and 15, um, that might be something we'll look at. But it, it's something that our rating committee will have to look at in light of uh, market trends on a month by month basis almost. So, what could lead to a stable rating outlook? Um, well, stabilization in the economy. I think that's what they really need. Um, I think they've said pretty much some of the same things to me that they might have said to Bob uh, in private sessions, but they're, they're targeting about a quarter of the presentation when Puerto Rico comes in to talk to us is about economics and their, their turnaround plan. Um, 
And they're specifically, uh, apart from anecdotal stories of individual companies that are expanding, um, they're specifically trying to target um, their competitive advantage, which they feel is manufacturing lower cost wages and manufacturing for entities that would want to have the U.S. flag on them, which would be defense industries, whether it's just making uniforms or something else, uh, or pharmaceuticals, where they're worried about the regulatory environment. They don't want to manufacture overseas, uh, but still under the U.S. flag. Um, they've talked about other things. Tourism is still a relatively small part of the economy. Um, and, uh, and so we'll see what, what happens. Um, but the current trends right now have been down. And then the others, uh, if, they, if they had structural balance now, obviously uh, there probably wouldn't be quite as many people here in the conference room. <laughs> so uh, that would be quite a turnaround over the last, from, compared to the last uh, 12 or 13 years. Additional concerns, liquidity. Um, you know, are they going to have to sell a billion dollars of external cash flow notes in 15? Uh, we'll know when we see the 15 budget. Um, they have to renegotiate these VR DO uh, liquidity agreements unless they're going to refinance uh, the, that debt altogether. Um, and then uh, there could be, to a lesser extent, certain swap termination risks. Um, in the FAQ that I published in October, I detail numerically uh, what some of those actual numbers are. Um, the clawback, I think we talked about it. Uh, Prepa and Prasa, we, don't, we do not believe has the clawback. Uh, no clawback for Cofina. Uh, the general fund lease appropriation debt, I would get a question on that because our rating is on a par with the GEO rating. And uh, it's only about 4% of the overall debt structure. And uh, they do have statutory law that allows them to put a priority on payment on that, except for just a couple things. And we feel that it would not be in their interest to default on that very small <laughs> sliver when they don't have to, uh, if there was uh, a problem in terms of uh, lack of liquidity. Um, we think that uh, it would be hard for them to make a big distinction. Uh, we could take a look at that later. Um, but I know we've had some questions on that. And uh, in our write-up, we refer to the specific law uh, that's in involved there. Uh, the GEO bonds, of course, have constitutional provision where they have the first claim on revenues, uh, which is a bit stronger. Uh, COFINA. Uh, Basically, you've got very strong coverage right now, but if you go out to 2040, they need some modest level of uh, growth in the sales tax. Uh, so if they didn't have growth between now and 2040, there'd probably be a lot of other problems too. Um, and we, we feel that there will be uh, at least some level of growth, even if it's from inflation. Uh, but uh, it, it's enough to uh, put a negative outlook on our, our rating. Um, I noticed, uh, I forgot who had it before, but someone said 21% of income transfers. The 25% of income trans of uh, island income from uh, transfer payments we got directly from the GDB economists. And uh, they said that the largest portion of that is Social Security. Um, don't believe that's necessarily going to go away. Uh, and uh, we believe. Uh, Particularly, the older people probably are not likely to go to the mainland. Um, it is somewhat of a stabilizing factor. One thing that I didn't hear from uh, the economic panel, though, is uh, that the federal government can um, both help and hinder. One thing that could be a concern would be if they raise the federal minimum wage. If they're really saying that their competitive advantage is a low wage, uh, they come under the federal minimum wage law. Uh, that could be a very significant downside to their economy. Um, we're not expecting at this point any sort of federal bailout. Uh, we also rate the federal government. We've had informal talks with federal officials who at this point indicate uh, they're not going to uh, provide help if, uh, at this point. Um, so I think that's it.
We, we have a few minutes for questions. What I'd like to do for this question is start in the back and come forward. Jill, can you do that? Do you have it, Amanda? You have a microphone? There's one all the way in the back. First question all the way in the back, on the right side. No? Yes. Yes. Come forward. The back half of the room and fell, fell asleep. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, for both the gentlemen up there, uh, Moody's and Senator Employers, uh, with the fiscal year ending uh, at the end of June, uh, the big interest payment coming due on July 1st for basically all their bonds except the Cofino debt, uh, which is in August. Uh, do you gentlemen see them making? Uh, if, if everything stays the way it is right now, uh, making their interest payment for July. Yeah, I'm sorry. So the question is, do we um, expect them to make the debt service payments that are due right after the beginning of the new fiscal year? Yes, the, their debt service uh, and also their int interest payments due under debt. Um, yes, and, and we do expect them to be able to do that. We think there's ample liquidity and again our, our ratings uh, where they are right now uh, for us at BAA3 certainly imply that we expect their debt to be paid in full and on time. I would echo that. Hi. In a worst case scenario, has anybody worked out recovery values on Puerto Rican senior geo debt? Uh, Short answer is, is no. I mean, we don't know what a worst case scenario is. We don't know what they would do if they would default. Um, again, I think at this point, uh, we don't expect that. And we would look to, you know, basically um, for some indicators of that, uh, to market implied ratings, which uh, we, uh, John talked about earlier, um, you know, where spreads are right now, uh, sort of imply uh, for on our scale, CAA ratings, which suggests that the market is already sort of factoring in default to a different degree. Um, but that's, uh, that's a market um, implied calculation. Uh, another question for, for Bob. Uh, should, should the market assume that Moody's will downgrade Puerto Rico given one of the factors that was listed was the fiscal 2015 budget, which is outside of the 90-day period. And the other was, I think you made the comment that you believe they won't hit the $820 million uh, deficit projection. I think that was probably me, uh, Dave. Um, but uh, so right now, the current trends are they're doing better than budget. And the, the budget was for an $820 million deficit that had to be financed both with a scoop and toss and with uh, bond sale directly. So if the current trends continue, that it would be somewhat less than that. Uh, what was the second question? No, the, the question was for, for Bob. It was oh, that okay. Well, I was very happy to let Dave answer that question. <laughs> I was hoping I was going to get away with that. No. Uh, a couple of quick comments. One is um, the 90-day the, uh, the review period. Um, let me just try to clarify this a little bit because um, I, I, we get a lot of questions about it. Um, in our rating construct, you know, when we place a rating under review for upgrade, downgrade, or uh, direction uncertain, um, our Internal protocols um, say that we need to resolve that within 90 days, um, although there are, are situations and contingencies where it can go longer. Um, our recent guidance is that 90 days is not a target. You know, we're not, uh, we're not focused on scheduling a committee for the 89th day. Um, you know, we are, uh, our goal um, from an investor point of view, having put them under review <coughs> is to collect as much of the information as we can about the items we've identified uh, that we are going to be considering in the review period. 
um, and uh, go back to committee as soon as we're comfortable. We have uh, answers for the committee on those items. Um, I would also point out that um, this is not a kind of a check the box kind of thing. You know, oh, they did a Cofina transaction. Uh, yeah, cleared the market at 12%, but they sold those bonds. You know, so it's not just like a check the box kind of thing. When we go back to committee, we look at the totality of the credit, all the factors, and come to a holistic uh, outcome that factors in everything that we know about uh, all of the things that we're considering and design a rating accordingly. Yeah, kind of follow on to that point. Um, with respect to market access, what, how would you define the range on the cost of funds that would be um, viewed as workable versus problematic? Um, I think I just heard 12% is probably problematic. Uh, so, yeah, again, we get a lot of questions about, you know, what do we mean by market access? Um, again, I, I think it's a, it's a bit of an, you know, ill-defined um, concept. Um, to a certain extent, it's a function of, you know, the willingness of the uh, Commonwealth. You know, their, um, you know, Economics 101 and Finance 101 tells you, you know, there's always a market clearing price. We've seen with the um, interest in the hedge funds and others that, you know, there are willing buyers out there and uh, that it's an economic proposition for them. To a certain extent, it's a determination of the Commonwealth what is affordable. And of course, the higher the expense that they borrow at, the greater the operating cost of that is and the greater the budget pressure that that exerts is. Um, again, uh, w one thing I would point out that's different about Puerto Rico than we've seen, say, in the European credit crisis is um, you know, unlike uh, European sovereigns, which uh, frankly never pay down their debt, they only budget and pay interest on their debt. So periodically they have huge rollover risk, which means rolling over the entire corpus of their debt. And when there are market access issues or market pricing issues, um, those additional uh, debt service costs can be, um, can be crushing. Uh, Puerto Rico, and like all other U.S. muni governments, uh, sell serial bonds. They pay interest on the debt periodically. So they're only refinancing in the marketplace in increments. So they may need to go out and borrow another billion dollars. Um, whether you calculate the corpus of their debt at 70 or 55, as we calculate it, um, you know, that's a relatively small increment. It, it's not going to result in a crushing debt service burden, although when your finances are as narrow and strained as Puerto Rico's are, every additional cost is a burden. So, um, you know, again, as we look at this market access question, you know, we're looking really to get a better reading on uh, their willingness to access the market and at what rates, um, at what rates they can. But it's, it's, again, it's not simply a check the box kind of uh, issue. We have only a few more minutes for questions. We'll go to the middle of the room. Don't see him, sir, right here. Thank you. Uh, Here's the microphone for you. More of a comment than a question, but there was a, a request to uh, stop doing certain things uh, from the rating agencies. But I, I would request to start doing one thing. And I think it came out, Bob, in, in your description of your analysis, which is when you set up Puerto Rico and you do your medians against the states, okay, I don't know how valid that is, but it's a point of reference. But please put the other sovereigns that may might really truly be economic uh, comparables, whether it's other Caribbean nations or whatever, because I think the economic story would really come out in that situation, and then all the qualitative stuff that happens, you know, bridges the we'll, gap. Thank we'll you. take that as a suggestion, not a question, and get to another question. So right next to that gentleman. Thank you. Uh, this is for both you guys. What's the justification for having COFINA for senior and sub completely the same rating for the whole term structure? Did everyone hear that question? That, that was a very insightful one. For, Repeat your question so everybody can hear you, sir. Uh, for COFINA, what's the justification for having the whole term structure for senior and sub be the same? The whole, okay. First of all, let me just, the question, be, the comment before, in the, if you look at our FAQ at, that we published in October, at the very end, it does talk a little bit about ratings on some other Caribbean islands and their GDP per capita. It doesn't go into all the debt. Um, so the question was about COFINA and the subordinate. I didn't quite understand your question, I'm afraid. So, 
So you're saying we should be rating by maturity? No. Well, that's another issue. <laughs> that's another conference. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you could say that for anything we rate. Um, and we haven't, we're not there. And maybe at some point in the far future, that might be the case. Uh, I don't think the market's really asked that of us. Uh, obviously, something further off would be more uncertain. Uh, generally, we're looking sort of at a five-year outlook, uh, two-year outlook for a specific rating outlook. Um, we, there's no nothing underway at S&P to rate by maturity. Uh, Bob, do you comment? Uh, I, I would echo David's comment. You know, the market's not demanding of that. Us of that of us. Um, when we rate the bonds, we rate to, you know, paying in full over the term of the bond. Um, our rating has to be good for, you know, the uh, uh, last maturity investor as well as the first. And it's, of course, as David said, you know, we could, there's clearly lesser risk in any bond that's rated in the first two years than in the last 10 or 15. So, you know, we, we haven't really, it, it would be a, a horribly confusing rating scheme for investors if, every bond had a different rating by maturity date. Um, we're just not ready to go there. Uh, trying to give as many people opportunities as we can, so we want to go as quickly as we can. Natalie? Um, this is maybe a difficult question. How, how does the actual act of downgrading to below investment grade that may have significant financial consequences in and of itself such as you mentioned, collateral calls on swap agreements, perhaps forced selling in certain corners of the marketplace. How does that figure into your discussions and your decision making? And I guess what I'm trying to understand also is the stickiness of the rating. Um, I, I'll speak for us. I, I, frankly, I, I would be surprised if Dave has a different response. But um, it's very clear throughout our rating structure across the entire company, every business segment, every business line, we do not forbear. Um, you know, we move the rating to wherever we think it is appropriate, regardless of any market or um, financial consequences. Uh, for us, uh, the rating spectrum, the rating spectrum is a continuum, and the difference between BAA3 and uh, BA1 is a notch and uh, we are going to assign that notch um, as we see fit. And, uh, and, you know, we know there may be consequences. Um, you know, we are, of course, assuming the consequences, you know, as we uh, go through our evaluation, because if there are, for example, triggers um, that create other financial stresses, we need to understand what those are so that if we move the rating, we get it to the right place. But. Um, no, the rating isn't sticky, and uh, we are not um, permitted in any regard in any business line to forbear because there may be consequences to the market or the rated entity as a result. Yeah, I mean, it'd be death to our business if we did that. It's not what people want, it's what we actually believe. Um, now, the question might be expanded to say if there's a credit cliff, what do you rate it? That's a stickier question, but next conference. Rick, quickly. Uh, Rick, microphone, Puerto microphone. You're a Puerto Rico government official. You have a choice of raising taxes and seeing the economy kind of roll over or flat and doing the right thing for your budget or waiting, uh, borrowing, or, or trying, to play, trying to play the musical chairs in the hopes that your economy is going to grow. For either of you, do you look more at the long run economy or how the economy is doing or whether the Puerto Rico officials are doing the right thing and ad um, addressing their fiscal problems um, with the risk that it will force the economy to roll over? What, what would you rather see? What is it that you're looking at? Better economy, more responsible finances. Two well, seem to be and again, I think from our view, you know, we're looking at it holistically. You know, the whole thing has to come together. Um, it, it's fine to make a good effort, you know, get an attaboy, get a pat on the back. Is it enough? Uh, is really the question. Um, one of the, I, I think, really challenging issues for the Commonwealth and in our analysis right now is um, despite the fact that they've made a lot of difficult decisions and continue to 
uh, I think, surprise us and, and the market uh, and perhaps even the residents of the island with how willing they are to make those difficult decisions. Um, the question is, are they doing enough? It's going to be very challenging for them to continue to tax and cut their way back to structural balance with the very large debt load they have if they don't get any economic growth support. It's going to be very difficult to do that in a flat to declining economy. Uh, much more achievable if they have any growth. And so a lot of, uh, a lot of our view, and I presume your view, is really predicated on whether or not any of that is likely to happen. Yeah, you need both. The one year when in the, since 2006 when they had an uptick in the GDP was when they had some big tax cuts, uh, which were reversed uh, because of structural balance. So the, the best financial management in the world cause still can't overcome a, a really weak economy. Uh, if you don't have the resources, it doesn't matter how well you're managing your dwindling resources. So they really need to have a turnaround in the economy uh, no matter what they do. Uh, very quickly, one, two, last question will be mine if no one asks it. Great, th thank you. Uh, very, very briefly, I use the $70 billion figure when I'm looking at the amount of debt. Could you just clarify very quickly how you get to, I think you said maybe about 95? Okay, at 38 billion, um, and so um, let me just, I, maybe we can follow up later if you want to give me your card, but so I can just tell you the categories that we include in that. So we have, um, the GO, appropriation debt. We put the ERS pension bonds from the pension bond issue they did a while ago. We put COFINA in that. Um, and uh, I can give me your card and I'll follow up with you later. Okay. And just quickly and, from, I'm sorry, go ahead. And, and I was just going to say, and then there's the extra 25 billion of the non recourse stuff, which people added. But even if you add that in, it still doesn't get you to quite the 70 billion. But. And, and from our perspective, we use a number of about 55 billion. Um, we include, which we call net tax supported debt, you know, which includes um, PRASA debt because the Commonwealth has, of course, <laughs> continued to subsidize that uh, entity. Um, we also include GDB's debt and the short term debt, lo all these loans that they've taken out. Uh, the largest component of what we don't include as self supporting is PREP. Sir. Last questions for Bob. Um, I'm going to ask a question that was asked earlier. Please. Uh, I'm going to ask a question that was asked earlier in a way that you may be a little bit more comfortable asking, how often when you put a rating on review for downgrade, do you guys often follow through and downgrade the credit? I, I, I've seen some statistics reported, and I'm pretty sure you guys report on, you know, the, the rating transition, so it might be yeah, helpful. Um, well, I, you know, again, I, I think um, there's, I'm, I'm not sure what the statistics are exactly. Um, you know, generally when we put something on review, we, we say there's, you know, an equal likelihood that the rating could move down or not, you know, kind of a 50-50 proposition. It's kind of the way we think about it analytically. Um, I, I think the statistics are probably higher for rating movement in the direction of the review. Uh, I don't know what they are off the top of my head. Please hand your surveys to Amanda or Jill. There's Amanda in the back. Raise your hand. This is Jill. Let me ask one final question. There was a $400 million payment from the development bank to Barclays. It came from cash, which the development bank had previously indicated it was being held as liquidity reserve to manage the debt role. Barclays was silent and the development bank was silent, so we can only speculate on whether Barclays wouldn't roll or not, and we can speculate about all the rest of the decision. My question, when you saw the payment, and it came from a pool which was represented as a liquidity reserve, did it alter by any nuance how you viewed downgrade or risk? And can you even come on that? Did you know it was coming? Well, that was a ban, and so the extent that they didn't take it out of public debt, um, you know, it's an indicator that market access has been diminished. And also an indicator that they had uh, sufficient liquidity to pay that off without having to roll it, and, and now have found some other 
uh, recourse to bolster that liquidity. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't, uh, I don't think we would have considered that kind of a deterministic credit event. It, I mean, it was small enough so that I don't think we'd consider it small in comparison to GDB assets uh, necessarily significant enough at least to have a rating action. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed the conference. We had a wonderful close with a panel, and we'll see you in Phoenix or Sarasota or Paris or Jackson Hole. Thank you very much. <laughs>